It's every argument against tenure. Good one, Tim Salvo. Oh. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Professor Bernard. Stick up your ass. And I'm here to warn you about the evils of comic books. Much like the evils of gingivitis. Comic books? What's the harm? Well, I'll tell you. Communism, communism, communism. Communism! communism. 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 Yay! Yay! All too often, these four-colored funny books show a crazed vigilante taking out a rich tyrant. Well, you may not like that the rich are above the laws, but by God, that's capitalism, and it's worked out pretty good so far. If you don't count the countless Ponzi schemes and economic collapses. Besides, we have laws in place. Which we've just confessed that the rich won't follow. Laws that will keep the rich from going too far and getting too much power. Like, say, a mail-order steak salesman with no political experience being elected president. So while the rich are figuring out the best way to make America the greatest damn country in the world... We must do our part. Resist these commie pamphlets that disparage our super-rich lords and masters. And continue to support your local business. Except comic shops, apparently. And above all else, enjoy, enjoy the, the show! show. <laughs> back to the SOL. That's the studio of a loser. It's time for another episode of Comic Book Issues, and I'm your host, Brian Hines. And if you're wondering why I'm not wearing a jumpsuit for this, it's because after I stopped doing my Fallout Crate unboxings, I got rid of my old jumpsuit, and I just don't want to be the guy who has to buy two jumpsuits in the same decade. Oh, uh, and if I haven't telegraphed this enough, today we're reviewing the Mystery Science Theater 3000 comic book. Published by Dark Horse Comics and written by the writing staff of the recent Netflix revival, including Mystery Science Theater 3000 creator, Joel Hodgson. Starting in the late 1980s at local TV station KTMA in Minneapolis, Joel Hodgson put on a show that was part silent running, part universal horror film, with a good dose of irreverence stuck in the middle, as Joel and his robot pals were forced to watch the worst movies in existence. And by worst, I mean they weren't particularly bad. Mostly they were badly made. Cheesy being the operative word. After several cable channels and a change of hosts, Joel Hodgson out and head writer Mike Nelson in, the show came to its conclusion. However, movie riffing has now become a genre onto itself, and the rest of the cast spread their wings with MP3 riffing, live tours, both large and small. A few years ago, creator Joel Hodgson broke records at Kickstarter and relaunched Mystery Science Theater 3000 with a new show under host Jonah Ray. While Netflix has canceled the new series with 20 episodes three live tours, and this comic book series under its belt, it would be hard to call the relaunch a failure. And for 30 plus years, people have been talking over movies and telling those who shush them to just relax. Yes, I could talk about riffing all day, like how I have my own riffing program called Geek Riffs on this very YouTube channel, and how all three of my DVDs contain riffs on them, DVDs that you can buy in the link in the video description below. But this is not comedic riffing issues. This is comic book issues. But it might surprise you to know that Mystery Science Theater 3000, the comic book, is an older idea than you might think. The comic book was written by Harold Buchholz, Matt McGinnis, Cheryl Volpe, Seth and Mary Robinson, and Joel Hodgson, with art by Todd Nock and Mike Manley. The Mystery Science Theater 3000 comic was an idea long in the making. Back in the day, MST blew up putting out a movie, a book, and premiering on the Sci-Fi Channel. There was also talk of a Mystery Science Theater 3000 comic book. Specifically, Mike and the Bots making fun of old Gold Key comics. No art examples were ever shown, and the fans of the show could only wonder how this would go about. Cut to some 18 years later, and Mystery Science Theater 3000 is blowing up again, leading to a new series, and yes, a new six-issue Mystery Science Theater 3000 comic book published by Dark Horse Comics. Issue 1 opens on Moon 13, Joan and the Bots, Crow, Servo, Gypsy, and Cambot, along with new robots Growler and M. Waverly, are investigating a new device that has mysteriously appeared on the Satellite of Love. They are contacted by their lord and master, Kinga Forrester. Her sidekick, TV's son of TV's Frank, you can call him Max, and Cynthia, the clone of Kinga's legendary grandmother, Pearl. They have a new invention to try out on Jonah and his crew, the Bubble Late R. 
a device that can transfer anyone into an actual comic book, as she demonstrates on Max, inserting him into a funny animal comic. But there are differences besides the MST crew actually appearing in the comic book. Any word balloon with a circle on the balloon is brand new dialogue written for this miniseries. Kinga introduces them to the nightmare-fueled world of Johnny Jason, teen reporter. Tom Servo is Johnny Jason, and sees Gypsy, M. Waverly, and Growler also inserted into the story. Teen movie star Shelley Marks is almost kidnapped. Tom, I mean Jason, is sent to investigate if this was a real kidnapping or a PR stunt a la Shemp era Three Stooges shorts. Tom meets Shelley, her family, her staff, and even hits a groovy teen party, which the Mads crash in order to sell Totino's pizza rolls. Damn it! I say no! It's bad enough that a comic book has to have full-page ads in it, that comic book TV shows feature commercials, and even comic book movies are rife with paid product endorsements. But to have a product endorsement inside the story pages of a comic? Again, sir, I say no. For as long as I, Brian Hines, am running this show, comic book issues will never resort to any sort of moral prostitution by selling valuable airtime to Big Brother and the Almighty Dollar. I want to spare yourself from advertising by trying one of my three ad-free DVDs. The Last Hungry Geeks Volume 1 and 2, and of course, Geek Griffs, the DVD. All hilarious and available to purchase at the link in the video description below. So good you'll forget I'm a hypocrite. A fight breaks out, but Tom runs off the ne'er-do-well and is promised a tour of Shelley's ranch. Issue 2 starts with Kinga penning herself on the back for another great evil invention and sending Jonah and Crow into the nightmare-fueled world, copyright Kinga Forrester, of the Black Cat. No, not Spider-Man's busty ex-girlfriend in the leather jumpsuit, but rather a leggy motorcycle-riding crime fighter. So the main difference is... a uh, motorcycle? <laughs> but before the story can really get going, there's another Totina's ad with Kinga and Max who get blowed up good. Blowed up real good. Also, Crow flies into a different comic book. In Black Cat, a mustachioed crime boss known only as The Rook has called the gangs together to put an end to the Black Cat's reign of terror on organized crime and offers a bounty for her true identity. Logically advertised on billboards across this great nation of ours. Jonah, a radio DJ in this reality, starts advertising the fabulous contest to take away a strong woman's independence and aid organized crime at the same time. The Black Cat heads to the radio station and follows Jonah, who's delivering a truck worth of guesses. Seeing they're being followed, the crooks driving decides they can't risk destroying these guesses and open fire. Jonah's car is hit and goes off a cliff. He's fine. Black Cat, passing some hitchhiking robot ghosts, guns her motorcycle across a drawbridge leading to the only building on a remote island. Before we can find out what happens, King Gun Max track Crow heading into a horror comic called Horrific and a story called Tale of Death. Crow plays mediator between two brothers, one sane, the other insane and experimenting on rats. The insane brother is trying to shrink rats and succeeds in shrinking one to oblivion, but before it goes, it bites him. Crow and the sane brother then find the shrunk-down scientist and lock him in a parrot cage as they prepare the antidote. Cured, he grows back but kills his brother in a fit of rage, only to discover that the cure was temporary. He shrinks back down and gets eaten by a cat, as Crow assumes the disturbing visage of some sort of, let's say, keeper of some sort of tomb or vault or mausoleum even. Back in Teen Reporter, Tom learns Shelley, the movie star, used to be Shelley, the meek girl nobody liked, as explained by the mother of Shelley, the human offspring. Chuck, the foreman of the ranch and sufferer of white male rage, gets in Tom's face about defending Shelley from a bully. But fortunately, Shelley defends Tom from his bully, Chuck. She takes Tom on a tour and then flies him over the mountains, losing them Waverly in the process. But just as the plane runs out of fuel, the Mads break to go back to Black Cat. Jonah arrives at the Rook's castle. Eh? Eh? But when he refuses to do a little tasteful cross-dressing, gets dropped down a trap door. Black Cat also confronts the Rook, and like Jonah, she goes through the trap door and winds up in a dungeon. They somehow use a power cable to open a locked door and escape. Then a little judicious automatic weapon fire curtails the mobsters and gets Jonah an interview with Linda, who just might be a part-time crime fighter slash socialite slash actress slash air raid warden. In the horrific story, Terror on High, Crow tells of two men who find their way to a frozen monastery. The fires give the men shelter while explaining that the extreme cold has preserved the bodies of their dead for centuries. The two men are actually treasure hunters here to rob the graves of these corpsicles. The next day, they knock out one of the friars and go about desecrating some corpses. As they amscray, the night is pretty spooky. They find shelter in another cabin, which is knee-deep in a Moon 13 Totina's Pizza Roll Party. Woo! Okay, for the record, I love Totino's Pizza Rolls. I mean, they're pretty tough and doughy, and they don't actually taste like pizza. But I think they're going for a fried ravioli thing. 
They don't taste like that either. But if you've got a slingshot and a bag of frozen Totinos, mm, boy, how do you say a good time? And then later, they defrost and rats eat the evidence before the cops can find it because they're looking to find out who's been pelting the neighborhood boy with frozen pizza rolls so many times it gave him a concussion. But you know the best way to defend yourself against frozen Totino's pizza rolls? With the Last Angry Geek DVD and you oh, okay, that was, All right, that was too far. That was too far. I admit it. Sorry. Sorry. We're done. We're done. Let's go back to the review. As Crow trashes the party, the grave robbers return to their cabin, only for a knocking at the door. It's those dead guys they robbed. The men run, fall off a cliff, and freeze to death. Crow explains that the friars would find their bodies and place them in the deep freeze crypt as well. Irony. Over in Black Cat, we've entered a time when white people didn't care about other races or how they're portrayed. Something I'm proud to say is no longer the case. Still in this dark age, a white woman was cast in an Asian role. Scarlett jo <coughs> Linda Turner, our Black Cat, is learning how to respectfully represent the Asian race thanks to her tutor, Fu. Fu gifts Linda with an imported Buddha statue against his son Chang's wishes. Essentially, Fu tells Chang, F you. Linda sees her statue stolen, but trails the thieves under the guise of the Black Cat. The figurine is returned to the import shop run by her teacher. That's right, when he's not teaching white women how to act Asian, he rents Asian props to film companies and sells the rest to bored white people looking to impress their equally bored white friends. Anhui has been a god to Fu and Chang. Linda is almost roasted alive by a dragon, but it's just that rascal Jonah Heston. They catch Chief Bad Guy Tenson, who's after the Buddha that Chang, in fact, stole from his sect. That's right. In China, Chang smuggled a sculpture that Fu foisted onto Linda later, and now Tenzin will be tense in L.A. lest he bags the Buddha back to Beijing. This is how Lin-Manuel Miranda got his start, right? Fu shows up, and Chang admits that he's been gambling and using his dad's import business to smuggle in gems to pay off his debts. They return the gems hidden in the Buddha just as Rocky Slade, dapper gentleman crook, arrives. Cut to horrifics, the clay coffin. Crow narrates the tale of Grover and Hortense. Hortense is convinced her husband is disinterested in her ugly looks and throws herself into her sculpting work. Her intuition is spot on when she catches him macking on the maid. She then poisons the maid, coats her in clay, a substance impossible to damage, and displays her as a prize-winning work of art. No, oh, you all judge her, but tell me Banksy wouldn't do the same thing. <laughs> Hortense leaves Grover at home so she can go on vacation. Seeking out that plastic surgeon from the 1980s Batman movie, she gets a brand new gorgeous face, even if the eyes are flesh-colored and the right one is off-center. Hortense returns as Agnes, the new maid. Grover flirts with her, leading to dinner and all the affection Hortense has never had before. So naturally, she kills him. As she goes to turn her husband into a statue, she loses balance, and they both go in the lime pit. The Metal Luton police have no luck finding the corpses, so even though this comic already has two bodies in line, we leave with a slow dissolve. The Mads return to Teen Reporter, only to find that the bots have been having a delightful day off with dogs, records, and lemon bars. Kinga arrives, yada yada yada, Wizard of Oz, yada yada yada, Totinos. Kinga is less than happy that Max and she couldn't get the story back on track, but Cynthia has come up with a way to hurry the story along. The Rover Extruder. It inserts some giant purple scrubbing bubbles that remove the extraneous characters and allow the story to resume. Tom and Shelley have a requisite North by Northwest moment with them Waverly before crashing into the mountains. However, this mountain is also unfortunately the hideout of the very same gang that tried to kidnap Shelley earlier and they get a tip off to her being close. They're captured and marched back to the gang's extremely small but bigger on the inside tar uh, shack. The leader makes odd mention of a fraction and things look dire. But Kinga transfers us back to Black Cat in time to see Asians being mistreated by white men on the West Coast. What? The dignified non-stereotype that is Chang gets murdered and a bridge fight breaks out. The bad guys are defeated and Fu bids farewell to his son. But the Buddha's jeweled eyes are missing. Linda and Jonah find the jewels in the Buddha that Chang used to replace the original one his father gave her, meaning he somehow mixed up the two identical Buddhas before the comic even began, but did it... God, this is so overly complicated that it makes Danny Aiello's return at the end of Hudson Hawk sound plausible. Jonah heads out and Linda has a good laugh with her dad. Only he knows what she's got on under her dress. Jonah then changes outfits and heads on a studio tour. Blah, 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 pizza rolls, blah, 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 mads. Meets Linda and her dad, blah, blah, blah. No one comments on this drastic difference in art styles. Back in the next issue, I, I mean the next movie set, Linda is now filming a Russian epic. However, she finds her jewels. <sighs> this girl needs a wall safe being robbed by the self-identifying Ivan Resnick. But I'm sure giving his full name to the woman he's robbing and can identify him as a burglar won't come back to bite him in the ass. 
Jonah and company burst in, and Ivan kills Linda's father, turning her into the orphan she always needed to be in order to be an effective superhero. He tries to abscond with Linda, but she drops several backdrops on him in the back lot. Cut to horrific and Crow telling the story of the Iron Maiden haunted by its victims. Mr. Matterman is opening a modern-day torture museum. Something that just screams husband material, I'm sure. At his castle, he finds someone dead in his bed. The local ugly guy, Hans, is of little help. The corpse is a painter who died falling off his ladder and onto a spike. They remove the body to the dungeon with Mr. Materman planning to do in Hans as well, for... reasons? Hans topples the Iron Maiden and the ghosts awaken, calling for his end. The castle explodes and Materman realizes he has a gold mine on his hand for the pro-torture hobbyist on vacation. King is a bit surprised that Crow was able to alter the comic book's ending, but there's one issue left. Time to take over the world! With comic books. That's a thing! So many wasted years not ruling the planet. And we return to Black Cat. As Ivan escapes, leaving behind the Eye of Karnak jewel, Linda finds out that, sadly, Dad is going to make it. One costume change later, and she's after the bad guy. Then, because Linda's dad has so much bad luck, it's like he's always around a black cat. Oh. Uh, anyway, the ambulance he's on gets held up. With his time running out, they're forced to take the criminals to a nearby farm. The same farm that Black Cat has tracked Ivan to. He gets the better of her and forces her to go back and take the Eye of Karnak, lest Jonah and Old Man Turner die. Ivan takes off with Linda's dad as eavesdropping cops arrive to free Jonah. Black Cat tries to steal the jewel back, even though Linda Turner could just walk in and take it, but security is too tight. Jonah has a plan. She'll hand off a fake set of jewels while he rescues Tim. It goes exceedingly well, with Ivan getting his jaw broken. Later, Linda reveals her identity to Jonah, who can't make much use of it as he's bubbled out. In Teen Reporter, Servo has knocked out their lone guard and they make a break for it. Seeing Shelly vulnerable reinforces his alpha male instincts, but come morning they're cornered by silhouettes that may or may not be the bad guys from the last chapter, or a rescue party from the local ranger station. As anyone who's ever watched the cartoon knows, the slightest sound, in this case gunshots, will trigger a deadly avalanche, sleeping the mobsters to their deaths. Returning home, Servo comments on the gangster mentioning 12.5%, which is the commission they pay Shelly's agent. He was behind the kidnapping, because one large lump payment is always better than a small ongoing payment. Before he can explain why he charges 12.5% instead of the standard 10, the burly Chuck jumps him. Turns out Shelly and Chuck are in love. Her parents approve, but Shelly can't act anymore and must be a submissive female. A happy ending for all. Tom returns to his editor and tries to sell him on a story about a robot experimented on by mad scientists when the bubbles arrive. Thank you, thank you. Many of my younger audience probably don't know who Lawrence Velk is, but I couldn't think of a better gag for bubbles than that. Maybe I grinned at the good bitch joke, but I've already made the Wizard of Oz joke earlier, so why repeat myself? Anyway, let's get back to their champagne comic books of mystery science, Teal Turtle, Crow has one final tale Devil's Claws. Concert pianist John gets in a terrible accident and loses his hands. His girlfriend Mary tries to cheer him up, but he's doomed to spend the rest of his life playing chopsticks. Wandering alone at night, he meets Henry Jones, a surgeon who promises him new hands. John agrees to the surgery. Max is watching with glee, and his king remarks on the predictability of limb transplant-related murder. They liven things up with a Totina's Pizza Roll volcano in the story, spreading melted cheese chaos among the commoners. Angered, Crow does a majestic leap into the air, diving headfirst into the volcano. The mad screen goes black. Achieving ultimate power in the comics universe, the Mads find the bubble later is out of fluid while the SOL crew is back on their lunar stationary home. Okay, so the bubble later is broken, but Cynthia thinks the recent Crow comic could be a real hit. The SOL gang has a good laugh at their four-colored adventures, while on Moon 13, the Mads detonate a new Moon logo. Mystery Science Comic Book 3000. But an ominous slinking figure appears, and the Mads are confronted by the consequences of their own dark hubris. The Crow Keeper is back, and you know you want him, baby. <laughs> oh, even when he's an alternate universe clone, as long as Crow hits that famous catchphrase, we're going to be all right. Well, that's the entire six-issue run of the Mystery Science Theater 3000 comic book. Longest title for a comic ever? Yeah, maybe. But was it any good? Did what little plot it have work? Were the jokes funny? When Jonah was in the bubble eater, how did he eat or breathe or other science facts? Hey, I'm a comic book critic. I need to ask these questions. And no, I can't simply just relax. So let's take a closer look at the Mystery Science Theater 3000 comic book. 
First off, I can only sing the praises of the art. Todd Nock, who's been a very familiar face in superhero books, does a style that's very cartoonish at times, but really works for the over-the-top villains of Moon 13. Incidentally, I talked to Todd briefly at C2E2. He's a huge MST fan, and when this new series came out on Netflix, he produced this piece of fan art that eventually caught the attention of the powers that be. But a huge nod needs to go to Mike Manley, who drew the bots and Jonah into all the classic comic books. Somehow he manages to match all four different art styles and make the characters he inserted look like they've been in that comic all along. Huge shout out to the colorists who aged the new art to match the old. It's really quite impressive. As for the story itself, the idea of the bubble aider enforcing Joan and company to interact with cheesy comics is a simple one, but fits with Kinga's self-described moniker, Queen of All Media. Yes, she focuses on movies, but anything she can slap her brand name on is fair game. I'm not really sure when the comic takes place in relation to the series. Cynthia is suddenly smart, and after one issue, Artie suddenly changes outfits, both things that happened between seasons one and two of the Netflix series. But then, between seasons, Jonah was thought dead at the hands of Max and Reptilicus Metallicus. With so many continuity problems, how can I possibly enjoy this comic? But then I guess I should really just etc. etc. Across all six issues, the humor was pretty funny. Now, full honesty, I don't normally like humor comics. It's usually a bunch of bad puns and dumb sight gags, but most humor comics are aimed at kids who don't know any better. There are some exceptions. Carl Barks' Duck Comics spring to mind, but the MST3K comic book is that rare humor book that worked. This is in no doubt due to it being written by Joel and his current crop of writers. We'll be here all day if I go through every single joke, but like a good Rift movie, it makes fun of the source material for its stupidity and logic problems, while using visual cues to inspire more out-there jokes that don't fit in with what we're seeing. But that said, there was one thing I didn't like. Totino's effing pizza rolls. That really felt like space filler. As though even with the comics and the mads breaking up those comics, there still wasn't enough room to fill six full issues. So, in comes Totina's sponsorship, and in fairness, it fits with Kinga's character, but otherwise, it didn't really serve a point. It wasn't funny. It wasn't really logical. Maybe if they'd changed up the sponsors going throughout. But it was always Totino's. At the very least, I hope someone at Totino's wrote Dark Horse a big check for this sponsorship opportunity. Okay, aside from that one rather glaring flaw. The Mystery Science Theater 3000 comic book proves itself to be that rarest of adaptations, one that works just as well in the new form of media as it did in the original. I'd love to see more adventures in classic Golden Age comics where you would have the MST3K crew drop in on some of Dark Horse's signature properties like Hellboy or the Umbrella Academy. I give the MST3K comic book issues 1 through 6 4 out of 5 stars. Well, thank you for joining me on this journey into two-dimensional riffing, and until next time, I remind you that I'm the most two-dimensional riffer you'll ever meet. This is Comic Book Issues, and I'm your host, Brian Hines.